Next, we're going to hear from Mary Jean Day. She lives in Penticton and is the mother of three children. Her eldest son died in 1980 of hidden meningitis. Unfortunately, the vaccine was not available in BC until 1986. This life-changing experience led her to become a registered nurse and eventually into public health nursing, where she is a strong vaccine advocate. Hi. I'm honored to speak to you today, and I want to thank BCC to c for, for inviting me to speak. In 1977, when Farron was born, sorry, my voice is a bit shaky, uh, we were quite young, and we just moved to Nelson, BC, while I was pregnant. I was 21 years old when he was born. That December at the Nelson Hospital, sorry. Mothers of babes usually stayed in the hospital for a number of days back then, but I chose to leave after 24 hours. I found the hospital too hot. I was having trouble sleeping. And over the next week, I was assessed by my midwife and my GP before we moved off to our newly purchased cabin at Apex Mountain Resort. And Farron was five days old at that time. And therefore, I was never visited by a public health nurse. Apex is a ski resort outside of Penticton. At that time, it was a 45-minute drive on a gravel road. There was no electricity or phone, so we had propane lights, stove, fridge, and heat. And the only phone was a radio phone on the, at the ski lodge, another kilometer up the road. So it was somewhat isolated lifestyle, but we loved it. Skiing on our doorstep, our own home that we owned, and a small community we were part of. Farron was a breastfed baby for 13 months, and if I'd known what I know now, I would have happily breastfed him for two years and beyond. His brother was born in 1979, when Farron was 22 months old. Farron had never had an illness until the December before he got sick. He got a very bad cough, and his baby brother also got that cough over the new year, and I took him into emergency because he'd burst a blood vessel in his eye. Um, I also went to my GP after that emergency visit that week because I was very worried. As I left my doctor's office that day, he said to me, Mary Jean, kids do get sick. Your kids have not been sick much, but kids do get sick. It was most likely he was trying to decrease my concern for what I felt. But what I felt he was saying was that you don't need to bring them in every time they get sick. They'll be okay. We earned our living by working at the ski hill, um, but also we, we worked in the silver culture business. In March 1980, my husband had the opportunity to work on a contract on Vancouver Island, which meant um, good money. So he went off to work on the island, and I was on my own with my five-month-old and my 27-month-old boys. I thought I was managing very well on my own, but it was very busy. The Saturday before Farron got sick, I had been to a workshop at the Naramata Center about Montessori preschools. They had a child care um, arranged, and my boys spent the day being cared for by about a dozen other children, but with a dozen other children. That following Tuesday, we'd gone to town for grocery shopping and chores. I went to visit a friend, and he, in the late afternoon when Farron started to get sick and he lay down on the couch, um, I felt he had the flu. I assumed he was getting the flu. CBC Radio had been my lifeline to the world in those days living up at Apex because um, there was no TV or anything. And a few days before, I'd heard on the CBC that they'd closed down school in Grand Forks because of a flu outbreak. So I was not surprised that he was um, getting sick with what appeared to be the flu. It was quite a long trip home that, that early evening as it had snowed all afternoon and there was six inches of snow on the road. He was sick with a fever and slept a lot on the Wednesday, and I treated him with Tylenol and pals. If I had considered taking him to the doctor that day, I had a number of reasons not to. There had been the snowstorm the night before. It was a big trip to town with me, for me with two young children. My doctor did not work on Wednesdays. And the last time I'd seen him, he insinuated that I didn't need to come in for every little thing. By Thursday morning, I was quite concerned as he was showing some neurological symptoms. A friend dropped by and agreed to drive down behind me in his car because I was concerned about going on my own. Once in town, we stopped at a local ski shop, and I ran in to call my doctor, and he said to meet him at the emergency. I went to the car and realized that something had happened to Baron. He died in respiratory arrest. In that few minutes, I was gone. It's okay. 
I jumped in the car and drove the 30-second drive to the hospital. I was very close. I grabbed him out of the car seat and ran to emergency. And I remember saying, my God, I think he's gone. They stabilized him and ventilated him, and I was told he probably would not make it through the night due to the meningitis he contracted. <laughs> this had been 40 hours after he first got sick, so it was fast. He did survive that night, and my husband got to come home from the island. My parents came from Calgary, and my in-laws came from Ontario. We all got to spend the next three days saying our goodbyes as the doctors were counseling us to remove him from the ventilator. His pupils were fixed and dilated. He was non-responsive and could not breathe off the ventilator. One comment a pediatrician made stuck with me. She said, they're trying, they're in the process of developing a vaccine for this. My mother-in-law said to that, too late for this little one. On Sunday, three days later, after his admission, my husband and I woke up and thought we had to let him go. He was taken off the ventilator later that morning and we had to learn to live with our tragedy. I was 23 at the time. I was young. Remember I mentioned that I had not been seen by a public health nurse. I lived 45 minutes from town. I had no phone. I did go to my doctor regularly, though, and do not remember the conversation around vaccinations coming up with him. I'd heard horror stories of children dying from immunizations, so I was not sure if I wanted to take that risk. I would have been what Dr. Marshall called... Um, the cautious parent. I was very convincible. Um, but the conversation just didn't come up, and I didn't pursue it. About two months before he died, though, I was in the public health office in Penticton. I don't remember how I came to be there, but contact was made by me, I think, but I don't really remember. I remember seeing a notice on the board that there had been two children in the same family who died in northern Ontario of diphtheria. I went home that night and realized that I could not live with myself if my child died of a vaccine-preventable illness. So both my boys were started on their immunization schedules two months before Farron died. Unfortunately for us, HIP was not available in 1980. Needless to say, my five-month-old was fully immunized. My daughter, who was born in 1987, um, I made sure she got the HIP vaccine as well as everything else at 18 months because that was when it was available then. I also paid for her to have her Z vaccine two years ago as she was going off to university and she had missed out on the grade 12 cohort by one year. I became an RN in 1984 and after 19 years of hospital nursing, I became a public health nurse because I strongly believe in vaccines and prevention. Occasionally, parents ask me if it bothers me to give babies needles and I have to say no because I've lived the loss of a child to a vaccine preventable illness. Thank you.